Welcome to the WhitmerCast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Jason Smith, and I'm a student at Chicago Theological Seminary, and I'll be your host for today's episode. And we have a great episode lined up. We'll be talking with Paul DeBarth, co-founder of the I Dig Nauvoo Project, whose mission it is to discover, preserve, and share the history and legacy of the beautiful city of Nauvoo, Illinois. If you'd like to join JWHA or visit our entire backlog of episodes and JWHA journals, go to jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. So, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself first? Well, this is an Iowa farm boy who... uh... His father walked from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Graceland College in 1931, 500 miles to be able to go to school. He worked his way through uh, Graceland at uh, 10 cents an hour on the college farm and fell in love with that uh, part of the world. And so after a few years, married my mom in Wyoming. Then they moved their family back to to the Monai area, bought a farm, and that's where they raised the family. I still have the farm in uh, near the western part of the Monai uh, as part of the legacy of the Barth family. And so that uh, close association with the dirt probably is where my archaeology begins. I, am, uh, I have had the good fortune of, of um, marrying Teparotu Rina Faura, who now adds De Barth on the end of that name. She is a Tahitian princess. She was homecoming queen at Graceland, and I had the privilege of uh, her accepting my invitation to build a home in Zion. And we've attempted to do that. We have five kids, eight grandkids, and the second great-grandchild on the way. We have all of our kids within within 30 minutes of us, and so we'll be meeting with the family for a birthday dinner for our grandson this afternoon. Um, because her family tradition is Tahitian, Polynesian, and the close-knit family is very important, then uh, that's one of the reasons that our kids are still close and uh, what we like to share together as a family every week if we possibly can. I envy you having your kids close to you. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a real blessing, and it really helps. Sabrina largely disabled for the last, well, she spent nine years on dialysis. And in the process, uh, I tried to get a kidney, but got cancer and had to beat the cancer for five years before she could qualify to get back on the list for a, ki- a kidney. I'm not sure how much detail you want me to go into, but I will share a chunk here because it was April 2nd of, of 2017, and she was in charge at church. She, by the way, was one of the first women in, in the community of Christ to be ordained. And I'll tell you that story, too, if you want to ask. But um, on uh, April 2nd, uh, she was in charge. I was speaking. I had just started my sermon. My phone rang, and it was St. Luke saying, have her here at 1 o'clock. Well, I was on a microphone at uh, Shawnee Drive when that happened, and so people there had all been praying for it for a decade. And so it was just an amazing experience, although I'm confident my sermon was quite uh, of good quality. I'm told that uh, nobody paid attention because they're all anxious to gather around Rena at the end of the service to reach their hands out to her and join the angels that were in our company. The doctor came out midway through the surgery to say that, that he had not sewed her up yet, but the new kidney was already functioning. And so that kidney has now been functioning for five and a half years. She has uh, been going through sciatic pain and has had a foot surgery that has disabled her and kept her from mobility. And so my job now is full-time care for her, but uh, it's been a beautiful, loving relationship now for 52 years. Oh, by the way, we had three tr- three church officials that told us not to get married because cross-cultural marriages never work. <laughs> yeah, that was 52 years, well, 53 years ago now. Well, congratulations on the, the long life of your marriage, and um, we'll continue to pray for Rena. Thank you. She's making a slow improvement. She got hit with COVID and COVID hit the kidney 
and now the kidney is trying to recover. It's a long, slow, painful syndrome that she's involved in apparently that uh, is delaying her recovery. And so she spent a lot of time pretty miserable, but um, to be able to have hopes and dreams and aspirations by which to offer a service to the community and to the church and to the world, she's a bridge builder. And uh, I'd be happy to share that uh, a chunk of her history because hers is so important to me. And you, you mentioned that she was one of the first women to be ordained in the community of Christ. November of uh, was that 85. And two years later, we went to Tahiti and and uh, in Tahiti, no women had been ordained yet. And she was invited to speak at the conference um, for her having grown up in Tahiti, speaking Tahitian as a child, having to learn French in school. Um, she had uh, never tried to present as an adult in Tahitian, and suddenly here she was asked to uh, present the first sermon in Tahitian by a woman, a minister in Tahiti. I think there were not any women ministers in any church in the Polynesian Islands at that point. And uh, she rose to that occasion. She, uh, she translated it, uh, translated her sermon from English into Tahitian, had her father help with some uh, verbiage. She uh, stood in front of 1,200 people to speak on that evening, and there were a bunch of them there that uh, were prepared to, to disclaim, throw fruit, throw fruit. Her mother had been one of the people who had spoken against her in the priesthood just a few months before. But uh, she she shared with people her, her reflections, uh, her appreciation of her mentors, Sunday school teachers, people that had uh, taken her to dinner and that kind of thing. And then pointed out that uh, her father had built her, their family house in the valley, carrying the uh, crates from the wharf on his bicycle up to the valley. And then they could pull, they could uh, pull the boards apart, pull the nails, recut the boards. And if you lean up against the wall of that house, you might very well get a splinter. Mentioned that, and a lot of people chuckled because apparently they'd had that experience. Anyway, as a seven-year-old girl, her job had been to pull nails and straighten them so they could be reused in building that house. And that, she said, is what God is calling us all to do, for we are all crooked nails. We need to be straightened so we can be reused in building his kingdom. I was standing at the back of that auditorium with our little boy at the time you know, in, in arms, and you could just feel the wave of the spirit across that auditorium as people recognized, yes, we are all crooked nails. We need to be straightened, to be used appropriately in God's uh, building of the new kingdom. And it's interesting to see that uh, not too long after that, Mareva was called to be an apostle in the community of Christ, the first uh, Tahitian and the first woman, <laughs> well, yeah, the first Tahitian woman to be called. And when she was ordained, she came down and the first person she grabbed and hugged was Rina to say thank you for being the Pathfinder. In 2015, Tahiti elected their first woman to be the senator representing the, um, the Polynesians in, in France. And she is still there functioning very effectively. And so you look at the, at the profound impact that this little lady has had on the culture and her bridging the cultures, and I'm just as proud as I can be to have Dick wrote to Rita Paura de Barth as my wife. Very beautiful. I wanted I want us to, to talk about the project itself that you that you co-founded, the I Dig Navu project. Can you tell us how it got started and uh, a little bit about what you do there? All right. In 1971, I had the privilege of uh, being on the archaeology project at Nauvoo with Robert Bray from the University of Missouri in the University Field School. And that was the summer that we worked on the uh, excavation of the, of the uh, summer kitchen at the homestead and the bee house. And Bob Bray saw how much I enjoyed digging, and, and I really did. I just thoroughly enjoyed the whole process of digging. I found a little trash pit, and I moved a lot of dirt. And so he assigned me to dig on the bee house, the uh, site where Joseph and Hiram uh, had their markers showing where they had been interred in 1928. 
Uh, I dug down about three feet and encountered the north wall of that uh, bee house, a wall of brick on, on limestone. And then at six feet below surface, I came down on the sandy floor that still had some of the square nails marking the casket along the south side. And along with that was some of the metatarsals and metacarpals. And so I uh, personally acquainted with Joseph Smith. Mm. The idea of, uh, of being able to dig and what for so many people is a sacred site like that clearly was a profound catalyst for me. And I have uh, I've spent most of my career as a volunteer um, leading the excavations in Nauvoo. And uh, I went back as his crew chief on, in, uh, 60, uh, in 75 and we excavated the Times and Seasons building. And in um, 76, I was looking for outbuildings uh, under his direction. 77, we started on the mansion house. Uh, we worked on that project until 83. And then uh, 84, we got the William Law store. Uh, the project lost funding from the uh, University of Missouri at that point. And so it was uh, 2005 when Mark Shearer asked us to come back to the sesquicentennial and we had a one week dig. But then in 2012, I met with uh, Locke Mackay and um, Bob Smith. Bob is a, is a direct descendant of Samuel H. Smith, the younger brother of the prophet. And Bob is uh, a real, a real uh, provider and he wanted to provide for excavations and facilitate them. Bach agreed and I agreed to go as the archaeologist and so I think Nauvoo was born out of the three of us determining that we could uh, provide a, a service. We had John Lothal and Ken Farnsworth who were two of the, the most notable archaeologists in the state of Illinois acting as mentors and they would come by every season to take a look at what we were doing and, and that is until they retired. And uh, we got a lot of great uh, advice and information from them. But the uh, I Take Nauvoo project then lasted until 2019, when then uh, in, in 2020 the the COVID hit us, and so we stopped for two years. And uh, this last summer in 2022, I went back and uh, resumed the excavation for the Times and Seasons site, the one that, the same one that we dug in in '75. Then we found 572 pieces of pipe. And uh, in 2022, uh, we found an additional uh, additional 55 pieces of pipe. And since this is the times and seasons and also a place where the 1840 Book of Mormon was published, then uh, it becomes highly significant in terms of the historical record. In addition to those, I would also hold up another little piece here. This is... Uh, this is a projectile point that takes us back to the middle archaic and as a signal of the uh, discoveries at Nauvoo. I'm particularly proud of the fact that we have, we have made it so that when Mormons come for the pilgrimage to Nauvoo to see the last five years of Joseph Smith's life, we can show them 10,000 years of that site being occupied and being sacred. 10,000 years ago, we had mammoth hunters there who were, who were brave enough to, to take a stick and a stone and go Harvest mammoths. I've taken a crew up to uh, to a site in in along the uh, Snake River, a hundred miles north and west of Nauvoo, where we found four mammoths uh, being eroded out of the out of the bank. One one mo one mo one mo uh, molar of, of the mammoth, mammoth is about the size of your head. Wow! The the tusk. We've got a chunk of the tusk and 23 inches in circumference. And that tusk had 30 rings in it for 30 years of growth. And it would have probably been 15 feet long. Now, if you got a critter with a tusk that's 15 feet long, you're going up to invite it home for dinner. What a, what a, a daunting task. Um, so we had the mammoth hunters there for, for several thousand years. And then the bison hunters... Uh, came along about the end of the Paleolithic period, beginning of the Archaic period. And so we have a dozen or more Archaic lancelate points of the bison hunters who, who would have harvested the bison as they came across the shallows of the Des Moines Rapids. They're right there at the bend of the river of Nauvoo. 
And if you can imagine a herd of 100 bison coming across with bulls leading away of their horns, reaching out as far as a man can reach, they're followed by the cows who are protecting the calves, and you're inviting somebody to come home for dinner with you, we have the stick and the stone again. Mm-hmm. Appreciate what a remarkable cultural background this is. And so to be able to share with the the uh, Mormon uh, visitors, the, the people who are coming because they are wanting to see the sacred site, I want them to also see that there is all this background. Well, in addition, the black sand incised pottery is found in Malibu. That's the earliest pottery in the Midwest, dating back 2,500 years. And the genius of being able to transform mud and turn it into something that will that will allow you to save grain and hold water and cook stew and so forth. That, that's just a marvelous demonstration of human ingenuity. And here we have the earliest demonstration of it in the Midwest showing up on our side of Malibu. Then we have um, a middle woodland burial, and a, well, we have an early woodland burial and a, and a middle, middle woodland burial, both on the same block that has a Smith Family Cemetery. We have about 25 bodies in the Smith Family Cemetery, primarily of the Smith Family, of course. And so we know most of who those people were and have names and ages. But then we have found two uh, earlier burials. The early one will take us back to that early pottery period, 2,500 uh, 2500 years ago. And the second one, about 2,000 years ago. So here's another 25 bodies on the prehistoric to compare with those in the historic. And to me, it's fascinating to see that more people live to be older in the uh, early period than with the Mormon period. In the Mormon cemetery, we have we have Major Biderman at 90, we have Joseph Sr., Lucy, and uh, Emma are the only ones that got to be more than 40 years old. Whereas we have, I think, six people that got to be more than 40 years old in the prehistoric. Uh, with the Mormon burials, we have a whole bunch of children, just a few children with the prehistoric burials. And so uh, in many respects, it appears that uh, we would, well, one would have been better off living in the prehistoric period than in the Mormon period. So again, let's appreciate the sacred history, sacred heritage of our... Now, well, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you answered it beautifully. So you've mentioned some of the discoveries you've made. What, what do you think is, has been the most uh, surprising discovery that you've made? You mentioned early on you, you found some remains that, that uh, were pretty interesting, but what, what's, what's your, your personally your favorite find that you've made? Better relationships. And yeah, that, that's true because with the archaeological investigations, we've had an assortment of people participating from all across the spectrum of Mormonism and local people and regional people. We've had Protestants and Catholics. We've had uh, agnostics. There's just all kinds of people that are interested in history and archaeology that have dug with us. And, well, for example, we were looking uh, for remain, for evidence of the, of the uh, Battle of Nauvoo. And by the way, we'll be looking for that again on uh, April 1st and everything goes well. We have another 100 acres to explore um, east of Nauvoo, just east of the Catholic Cemetery. And uh, with that 100 acres planted in soybeans this past year, it'll be good ground surface for us to explore with, with uh, metal detectors on April 1st. So if we can advertise to get more people to participate in that, they'll be welcome. Anyway, uh, Robert uh, Bick Baxter, who is the descendant of the Icarians, is the spark plug behind that particular exercise. I mentioned that because when our previous uh, study of the 30 acres that Charles Tripp had just east of Winchester Street in Nauvoo, we we had uh, a few a handful of metal detectors out there working and discovered that we had people who were descended from people who had been on opposite sides of that battle. And there's the lesson, better relationships. We do not have to fight and kill each other. We can learn to live together amicably. And that process, you see, is the archaeological birthmark that gave rise to the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. Because with two years of COVID, which I couldn't dig, I missed that uh, that little taste of Zion that we had with all those people working together amicably. And so we set up the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum in order to be able to share a bit more of that taste. And 
And here we are two, two plus years later, meeting every Monday evening, eight o'clock central. And uh, it's just been a marvelous experience. And you, Jason, have participated in that, uh, presenting the, uh, the Hancock story, um, the basement church in Independence. It's just been a delightful experience to have the uh, the president. Well, for example, we've had five different presentations on where the the uh, land of Nephi was. Um, George Potter says it's in Peru. We have a whole bunch of people who say that it's in the heartland in Georgia. We have uh, Olson says it's in the Malay Peninsula. Um, we have a whole bunch of people who say that it's in Guatemala. We have a few people who say it's in Joseph Smith's head. And so to be able to to uh, allow people to present their diverse views, support them with their best arguments, and now allow for, for questions and answers, we've had marvelous discussions that it normally last another hour beyond the presentation. And it's just been a, a soul-fulfilling exercise for me, a, a taste of Zion every week as these people get together and, and uh, and share across the chasms of our traditional religious uh, diversity. Well, I can attest that the the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum is um, is a unique blend of of folks that have some really good discussions. I've really enjoyed my my experiences with it. We had uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We had a review, and and every we have a review every eight weeks. But in that particular review, we had LDS and Community of Christ and Monongahela. Josh Gailey and uh, Bill Shepard of the uh, Strangites and the re Restorationists were represented. So there's five different expressions of Mormonism expressed in that one evening session with you. Just delightful to, to allow people to share their differences and share their commonalities and build from the commonalities toward better friendships. Well, I'm glad that you guys have, have got that going through COVID and, and continuing forward, I assume. I'm always looking for new presenters. We've had some marvelous presenters. Brian Stubbs has spent his life studying the linguistics, and he began studying the Semitic languages and then moved into Utah as taken and discovered several hundred fascicular cognates from the Utah as taken back to the Semitic languages, which is just a phenomenal, it's an archaeology of language to be able to trace those linguistic roots back to earlier uh, roots and means. And so he has, he has, his work is just one lifetime of uh, expression that I like to compliment because there's so much more like that that can be done in terms of the study of the Book of Mormon to better understand it. And this can relate, this question can relate to the, the uh, I Dig Nauvoo project and the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. What kind of stumbling blocks have you come across or hurdles that you've had to jump over um, to, to make these, these visions you've had for bringing people together um, happen? Oh, what kind of hurdles? Well, first of all, the, the, the fact that uh, we are working with volunteers means that you have to work with volunteers. And while we've had a few professionals volunteer as well, and the, the professionals providing volunteer guidance when you're dealing with volunteers and they, they have archaeology on their bucket list and they have a preconceived notion of how they are to behave and they, and they come and try to act that out and often that means they're gouging they're they're not following the directions and scraping instead of, of gouging they're going after an artifact rather than uh, than trying to study the whole context and understand the whole picture of where that artifact uh, resides the artifacts tell the truth. Historians often don't. I mean, historians are speaking the truth that they have an audience that wants to hear, but the artifacts can really offer a lot of correction on that. And unless you get the context out of which that artifact is speaking, then it's not likely to be able to share its whole story very well. And so, yeah, it may be, it may be fun, maybe fascinating, but uh, it's just not as as valuable as if you can have it in its appropriate context. And so I've been working on the, uh, the Times and Seasons material, but right now my primary focus is upon Hans Mill. Mike Riggs and I, back in the early 2000s, so I had uh, 2002 to, to six, we investigated Hans Mill and 
I had my high school students and my college students participate. We, we had a, a week long summer school with uh, Northwest Missouri State and found quite a lot of artifacts. And that site now has been sold to the LDS and and uh, we're 20 years behind in terms of getting everything written up, but we have the monograph on that uh, coming through John Whipple books uh, soon, soon as I can get finished. What, the, what's happened is I went to the archives in Independence and was given the uh, artifacts that they had in storage there from Hans Mill to review and clean up and, and organize. And so I'm in the process of working with the artifacts that were left by Price and Harlocker back in the 60s, the ones by Ron Romig, who was archivist for, for a number of years, plus then the, art, the artifacts that Mike Riggs and I um, excavated. And it's fascinating to see the, the depth of history. Well, again, we have a prehistoric occupation that takes us back to the Middle Woodland. Uh, we also have one projectile point that I think takes us back to the Middle Archaic. So here, Hansville was occupied uh, 5,000 years, 7,000 years maybe. And, and again, it's sacred to the Mormons because of an incident on October 30th, 1838, where 17 people were killed there. Um, again, in relationships. I had my students working on that project and we were giving a presentation to the Caldwell County Historical Society. And on the way up there, I asked my students how they're going to address this matter because the uh, Caldwell County folks were history people interested in history from a Missourian position, whereas the Mormons referred to Hansville as a massacre the Missourians didn't particularly like having that uh, attributed to them. And so it was interesting to, to see the wheels turning in the students' heads. And I was fascinated that when they presented, they presented on the Hans Mill incident in the Mormon War. I found a more neutral way to present it. And so digging up better relationships, I think, again, uh, <laughs> that, that is, is the best thing that I have found. Now, in terms of the art, the question that you're asking about, I think you're really going about uh, interesting artifacts. At the uh, the uh, Mansion House Hotel Latrine, we found a wealth of marvelous materials, and one of them was a, a porcelain hand painted uh, mug that uh, had the J and E Smith name written on it. Rarely does an archaeologist get to find the name of the uh, person they're excavating that they're looking for, but uh, that would clearly be one of the more significant artifacts that we found. In that same sequence, we found a, a $5 half eagle, gold half eagle. And uh, yeah, it's that's, that's undoubtedly significant. However, we were not suspicious at that time of uh, possible bogus money being made in Nauvoo. And so, I haven't had a chance to get, the, get a clear check on that one. But uh, we did find just about 10 feet from where Governor Ford gave his presentation on June 27th of 1844, the same day that Joseph Smith and Iron were being shot and killed in Carthage. He was standing on the uh, stand in the street corner of Main and Water, and he came to Nauvoo looking for bogus money, bogus blanks, because the uh, people of uh, Illinois were were frustrated that they thought the people of Nauvoo were were uh, fabricating their own coins and uh, using passing that off as legitimate uh, coinage when it really was uh, shortchanging the the uh, exchange. But we found a piece of eight, an 1842 Republica Mexicana coin that uh, has at least 13 evidences that it is bogus about 10 feet from where uh, Governor Boggs was standing. And so the fact that uh, Theodore Curley, whose property was immediately adjacent to Joseph Smith on the east, was arrested for bogus, you know, there's pretty good evidence that there was some bogus going on. And to be able to, to deal with the counterfeiting issues and to understand how Nauvoo as a, a thriving community with a whole bunch of poor people or was it getting its money to be able to, to produce itself as, as quickly as it did? Well, it appears that some people at least were contributing bogus money to it. Well, that, that is a significant uh, kind of artifact. 
Uh, but again, I would go back to the uh, to the mammoth points, the archaic points, and the uh, prehistoric materials. I think are highly significant because they open a whole spectrum of additional thousands of years of understanding of, of, of the sacred nation of the nature of the site. Paul, if you could go back to the very beginning of when you got started and take with you what you know now, what do you think that you might have done differently? Well, one of the first things was to, uh, to make an adjustment that I made later. You see, because Nauvoo was laid out in, uh, in the English system, and Bob Bray, as the archaeologist, knew that it was an uh, English system, he therefore laid out 10-foot squares. Anticipated the 10-foot squares would... Uh, correspond with the footage used by the Mormons. And um, so we expected, I mean, the historical record indicated that there was four acres in a block, and that would mean we could lay out 400 squares per, per uh, lot mm -hmm. and be able to cover a whole block with four sets like, like that. If you number every square um, appropriately, then you can write the number on that on the, on the artifact and know very close to exactly where that artifact came from. Well, Bob Bray pioneered uh, the work at Nauvoo in, eight, in 1970, and uh, he dug at the stable in 70, the summer kitchen in 71, basically took over in 77 and made the adjustment then of, of numbering the squares 20 north and then uh, 20 east from the southwest corner of a lot to make it so that our 400 squares would, would fit everything nicely. Well, that uh, worked just fine until we started working on the Samuel Smith site, which you see, the Joseph Smith Mansion is on block 147, lot three. Samuel Smith's home site was on block 147, lot one. And so if I go to the, to the northeast corner of the block, and measure back that I should be able to lay out my, my 400 squares and uh, have it to uh, correspond and cover that that part of the block just like I did on the mansion house. So I started digging and then we discovered there was about a 20 foot overlap. And wow, here was a, a major a major problem because an archaeologist wants to be able to accurately uh, measure everything in. And so we discovered that uh, when you look, when you use the measurement the Mormons were using, it was rods and chains. Mm. That's the feet. And so the irony is that if we had stayed with the metric system that archaeologists commonly use on the, on, from the outset, five meters effectively comes within an inch of being one rod. And so if we had stayed with the metric system, we would have been better off in terms of identifying the Mormon uh, sites uh, according to their own measure and what we were, we were imposing the 10-foot grid. All the things that I did make the adjustment on, we now use the metric, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, years of excavation with clumsiness from the 10-foot squares that uh, could have been avoided if we'd been using the metric system. <laughs> that would have been helpful to know, for sure. Yeah, most of us don't, uh, don't use the rods and chains enough to be acquainted with. My dad, on the other hand, uh, would point out the, the uh, windmill with so many rods from the house. <laughs> but uh, we, our miles are measured out in those rods. And so until we move to the, to the metric, then we've got this confusing uh, collection of uh, measures in our country. And most of us don't deal with rods and chains enough to, uh, to really know just how long they are. But uh, yeah, one rod is 60 and a half feet. And so four, four rods makes a 66 foot chain. And so we find that, that uh, many of the streets in Nauvoo were laid out uh, in one chain, 66 feet. Although Water Street, the first major street of Nauvoo, we discovered this summer was not um, always 66 feet. Only from the red brick store who were past the mansion house is a 66 feet wide. Uh, they enlarged it for uh, that business area of the, of the flats, but the original Water Street angled up to the uh, landing and went down past the uh, Moffat House, a mile or two miles south of Nauvoo. 
and it's marked in the 1837 Robert E. Lee map that he made while he was uh, working on the uh, the rapids, trying to dynamite the rapids so it would be better for, for river traffic. Is there anything um, that I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Uh, yes, I I would want to acknowledge that uh, that having spent a year in Mexico going to college at La Universidad de las Americas, my junior year of, of high school, of college, it, uh, Frank Fry and I hitchhiked to Mexico together and we spent that year together. And uh, in that process, we got uh, quite interested in and acquainted with the archaeology of Mexico. And so that's where archaeology really took off for me and and I thoroughly enjoyed exploring those archaeological ruins and sites, and I want to give credit there because everywhere that you look, you're always within sight of prehistoric materials. And to appreciate that uh, farther north up here, we don't have nearly as, as intense or prehistoric occupation, and yet we do have this 10,000 years of occupation evident, even at Nauru, uh, it uh, it is a, a striking contrast, and yet a, a striking similarity at the same time. Now, I would want to give credit to the Olmec and the Maya, the Tenteuacanos, the Totonacs, the Mixtecs, and the Zapotecs for having inspired me to want to continue to look under the soil. The psalmist says that the truth shall spring forth from the earth, and that I believe is the duty of the archaeologist to bring that pass. Do you have any collaborators or um, other people that have been beneficial to your research that you want to give a shout out to? Jane Bikestra is the founder of her own discipline. She came in 1976 when we uncovered the uh, early woodland burial at Nauvoo. And she brought her crew to retrieve the bodies. We did the rough cleaning and identifying of the um, what was it, 11 skeletons in that uh, cairn. And then she came back in 79 to reclaim the uh, 14 skeletons that we, that we roughly cleaned uh, over next to the red brick store, just 10 feet east of the red brick store. Having had that early connection with Jane Bikestra and appreciating that here was a lady who could stand basically on one toe between the, art, between the skeletons that were still articulated in the burial and bend over and uh, and map and retrieve all the information about uh, the artifacts related. She's just an amazing person in terms of, of that kind of investigation. She has then expanded into to, uh, uh, studies of mummies and lice and diseases related in Peru and uh, Egypt and, and China to world renowned. And so when Lak Makai asked me to contact her about uh, the bones of, uh, of Joseph and Hiram to see which skeleton would have limped. It was my privilege to be able to contact her, and she was kind enough to promptly come back with a quick response. And so that will be published again one of these days soon, and uh, I want to give her a, a shout out. Ken Farnsworth and uh, John Walthall have been our mentors at, at, uh, in, uh, in Illinois. Um, Kristen Donahue has studied the buttons of the Samuel Smith site. And it's fascinating because as an archaeologist, I can find buttons and identify them. But she sees the buttons and sees the costumes that they were wearing. So we now have, we now know 13 costumes that uh, Samuel Smith probably wore, plus those of his wife and children. And uh, it's just delightful to be able to have these people as specialists. And so, we now have approaching half a million artifacts in the basement of the Red Brick Store uh, for people to be able to study. And it is probably the most comprehensive collection of 19th century artifacts in the state of Illinois. So, yeah, there's room for a lot more uh, students to explore. And, I, and I, yes, I want to also thank uh, Andrea Alcevier at Western Illinois University and, and Benjamin Jacob uh, Skousen. He's the new archaeologist there. And they have agreed to come and start start a field school at Nauvoo. It was supposed to start in 2024 with, with Jacob uh, coming, but uh, Andrea has, has contacted me to indicate they want to come this summer in 23. And so 
the crew will probably be joining us on the Times and Seasons project and probably expand into the uh, prehistoric materials nearby as well. And so I'm excited as to have the Western Illinois Archaeological Field School staying in our campsite. And I dig Nabu with uh, Robert uh, Smith uh, work behind it to, to acquire about three acres there. But what's, what's going on? We have a house that we, we use for housing the staff. Now we're building a, uh, a dormitory, a small dormitory out of a shed that, that will house uh, four males, four females, or whatever combination you need. And then on that side, we intend to build the prototypes. So, for example, the, the uh, Joseph Senior and Lucy Smith double log house, which was one rod by one rod with a half rod uh, dog rod, that, uh, that building will be built as a prototype on the site, and we use that as a living quarters for, um, for our summer field school people as well. But uh, the idea that there's another generation of excavations and archaeological investigations to go on in Nauvoo with the Western Illinois University Field School is for me very exciting, very fulfilling, because having spent a lifetime uh, investigating there, to be able to pick up another lifetime to these people is just a, a, a dream fulfilled, a, a prayer fulfilled. Intellecti is the term I like to use there. Intellecti is the fulfillment of potential. And I believe in Zion. I believe in the Indalaki, in which we can fulfill the potential to learn to live together in peace. And that means we need to learn to share our commonalities and build from them rather than focusing all the time on our differences. It's beautiful. Well, Paul, I, I thank you for your time today. I, one last question. I know that you're always looking for volunteers, more people to help with this project. How can they get in touch with you and get involved in the project? I dig Nabu is our webpage. My email is debarthp at gmail.com and Robert Cook at uh, Robert Cook is our technology person for the Book Moment Perspectives Forum. If you'd like to get involved with that, but email me and we'll, we'll get you on the list so that you get the mailings to know uh, which sessions you want to attend and potentially which ones you want to avoid. But uh, because if you're, if you're interested in overall education, then you'll want to attend a lot of them because we have tremendous presenters, and you've been one of them. So uh, there's a there's an encapsulation of it right there. Okay. Well, again, I would point out that we uh, we're expecting to have another investigation with metal detectors on April first at uh, at the Battle of Nauvoo site, and then we we don't have the date firmed up yet, but middle of May to the uh, end of June is probably when we'll have the the uh, excavation of the Friends and Seasons. I'm also working on setting up an investigation at Liberty Hall in Lamoni, Iowa, the, the home of Joseph Smith III. Because we're approaching the Susquehanna Centennial for Lamoni. And so I've been pushing, been having conversations with people trying to get a Susquehanna Centennial committee set up so that uh, the new history of Lamoni can be written. We can do some archaeology. Hopefully, we can get the houses repainted, the Victorian houses repainted in historic. Uh, Victorian colors and try to help uh, that community reclaim more of its remarkable utopianist history. Let's see, what else? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I would like to give a plug for the story of, Nob of uh, the Mansion House. John Whitmer is right now publishing a series of historic and uh, archaeological monographs. The first one was Tunbridge Farm by uh, Sinker and uh, but uh, Tunbridge Farm uh, is the first of that uh, series of monographs. Mike Riggs and I are, are, have already presented the monograph on Hans Mill for uh, publication, although I'm revising that because I just got access to more artifacts. We have another project together on the Charles C. Rich cabin in Caldwell County. I'm working on uh, the Battle of uh, Nauvoo. I'm also working with uh, the Richard Graham on the Porter Rockwell Bar and Barber Shop on the corner of uh, Main and Water in Nauvoo. And uh, that's significant because that barber shop is where the stand was that now we have recreated, recreated so that people can celebrate the uh, speeches that were given from that stand on an annual basis. Uh, I'm also working on the uh, 
the Samuel Smith site, the Hiram Smith site, and then the major project that I have been working on for many years is the story of the Mansion House. And that, uh, when I went to Nauru this summer, I was at 664 pages, and that included about uh, 200 pages of timeline. Now the timeline has, has grown, and the pages have two. I don't know where we are, but this is fourth draft, and, and so one of these days, I hope to kick out the story of the Mansion House. To me, it's one of the most remarkable, fascinating artifacts of our heritage, because here is the here is the home base, the campaign headquarters for the the campaigning for the eighteen forty four presidency of the United States, and Joseph Smith was able to have something over six hundred people go through and uh, become emissaries for him, ambassadors for him, not only speaking for him to be president of the United States, but then also campaigning for people to join the, the uh, Latter-day Saint Church movement. And the fact that he was assassinated in that process means that uh, he was the first of only two people who have been assassinated while running for president of the United States. And that story is not very well known, not very well told. But it's fascinating because he was campaigning on a, on a platform that included uh, selling lands in the West and, and uh, buying the slaves so that the slave owners would not be too hard pressed to, to uh, give them emancipation. He wanted to make it so we could eliminate debtors' prison because he'd been there, he knew what that was like. He wanted to reduce the the politics and maximize the the uh, rights of individuals and groups. It's interesting to me to see that at the same time that Hans Mill massacre or incident in the Mormon War was being conducted in 1838, the Potawatomi were being driven from Indiana all the way to Kansas. And by October, they had gotten as far as Independence, Missouri. And so here at Hans Mill, we have an incident of murder of a bunch of people. The Potawatomi had left about 100 of their 800 citizens behind in that tie could cross the Midwest. And they got to Kansas. And yes, there's a, a county named Potawatomi County in Kansas. There's a, a cemetery down, in downtown Kansas City, Kansas. But uh, the treatment of these marginalized people is a treatment that I think we need to learn in history so that we don't try to repeat that when we establish or in the process of establish a, a Zionic community where people are living together in peace. Well, Paul, thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's been a fascinating interview. I love to hear you uh, tell your stories, um, and I hope to hear more in the future. What next presentation will you give in the uh, Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum? Well, I'm not sure. I, I've been thinking about that. You'll be hearing from me soon. Looking forward to, to whatever you have to come up with. Uh, but you, once you've been there and had a chance to get a taste of it, then you recognize it's not so awfully threatening. As a matter of fact, it's fun. And uh, to be able to pull people like yourself in that have interest in, in the history of this movement uh, makes it so that uh, there's just an awful lot of, well, to me, one of the neat things is to see that we have evangelicals and, and, and Protestants. We have ex-Mormons participating in the forum. And to be able to have all these people working together, sharing their commonality, because there may very well be something about the Book of Mormon that they like. There may be people that there, we've also had people like uh, like Brother Hendrickson from, from Europe who wants it repurposed, thinks that it's a tall tale, a tall tale from American history. And uh, you know, it gets interesting to get the various perspectives and try to benefit from an overall grasp of how the, the book's message is appreciated or not appreciated around the world. The fact that I, I, I'm coming to see it as universal scripture, the archetypes of the Book of Mormon stories are universal archetypes. And to be able to see those and appreciate them and use those and allowing the scriptural message of peace to be, uh, to be transmitted is, I think, uh, a very important part of our calling. You have a fascinating story here of, of a dysfunctional family with people uh, traveling extensively together, settling and going to war together and killing each other off. And then uh, with the message of Christ, they learn to get, live together in peace. 
what better encapsulation of the history of humanity? For we are a bunch of people who are dysfunctional family, killing each other, not learning to live together in peace very well until we embody those scriptures which are which should be written in our hearts that allow us to see our commonalities and build from those commonalities to a greater appreciation of our basic humanity and the intellect of Zion. All right. Thank you, Paul. And it will be sure and include in the show notes for today's episode how to how to get in contact with the I Dig Navu website and also uh, Paul's email address, information about the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. All right. Thank you again, You're Paul. You're welcome. My pleasure. We want to thank you for tuning in to the WhitmerCast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit jwha.info where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of the John Whitmer Historical Association, copyright December 2022, all rights reserved.